Okay, we're back for week nine, part two. And we have Jane Bosarth with us from the, not e-learning guild anymore, it's the learning guild. And as my colleagues and I were talking and chatting away on a bench in some for, um, country in Europe, I forget what one it was, we were in Switzerland or someplace, and my friend Jay Cross says, you know, we're not going to call it e-learning anymore. At some point, we're just going to call it learning again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took 20 years for that to happen or transpire. I think Ellen Wagner was with us, too. Probably. And she's now the president or the director of ACT of our field. And so, you know, we've got an interesting phenomenon happening in front of our eyes. And uh, we're having, you know, it's called learning again. I have a handbook of blended learning, right? Mm -hmm. And that came out in 2006. Do we need to call things blended again? Because everything is, in fact, blended in some way, shape, or form. Yep. So, so since, you know, this field has emerged, Jane has um, not only did a dissertation in it and moved from North Carolina, where she was in, um, not in the corporate space, working for the government, I think, the state of Cal uh, I was, North Carolina. I was with the state of North Carolina for, yeah. for long enough to retire from there. Yeah, so then she moved. Retire, yeah into this field and has contributed a series of books that are uh, some you some might want to pick one up so we'll talk a bit about that um, we'll talk a bit about the e-learning guild and what's going on in the field uh, and she's a highly popular uh, keynote conference speaker just like Jay Cross was when he was alive God rest his soul he passed away <laughs> in 2016 I think no 15 yeah I think 15, 15 16, yeah November 2015. Um, and usually, oh. you know, I just realized I'm always doing these in my office in the daylight. I don't have any natural light in here. Do I need to get a lamp or something? I, I feel like I'm awfully dark. Are we good? We're good. You're actually okay. pretty good. Um, okay. uh, you could if you want, but then it might actually shine too brightly. So um, it'd, it'd, it'd be yeah. a disruption. It'd take me a few minutes to work. And I'm sorry, I didn't even think yeah. about it being nighttime. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you were doing pre, okay. you know, uh, e-learning and what, what, why and how the transition happened and why okay. it happened. What attracted you? So tell us about, about, about the field you were in and then tell us what attracted you to this area. Okay. I was uh, working for the state of North Carolina. I'd been hired to be a classroom stand-up trainer. Um partly they wanted me to do literacy training. I had an English degree and nobody, everybody said, don't get an English degree. And then that was the thing that got me hired. And then I never did any literacy training. We had a lot of frontline healthcare workers. I was at a hospital for developmentally disabled adults. And we had a lot of frontline healthcare workers uh, who were very good at their jobs, but these were not scholars. And one day the state rather arbitrarily announced that they all had to pass a written exam which was a nightmare. And so we had some people who literally, I mean, they were, they were functionally sort of literate, but they aren't going to sit down and take multiple choice tests. It was, and it was the kind of thing that frightened them terribly. So I did do some work with some of them and, and eventually we figured out ways to kind of get them through the requirement without it being, being so daunting. But, um, but anyway, I ended up uh, doing a lot of management training and new supervisor training and new hire we weren't calling it onboarding yet. Um, and that was all stand up and it was fine more or less when I was in a spot where everybody was in, a, in the hospital in a self-contained space. But then I moved to the job. I took the job of training director for the North Carolina Department of Justice. And we had employees in a hundred counties. We had all of the state attorneys. We had the State Bureau of Investigation. We had um, Department of, uh, of uh, uh, Criminal Records. So we suddenly, I was, we were making people drive 300 miles and spend the night in bad downtown hotels <laughs> to hear the EEO officer read policy to them. And, you know, it was just crazy. So at about that time, the state does have a very generous uh, tuition reimbursement program. I used it for nine and a half years. They paid <laughs> my master's and my doctorate. They paid for the wow. whole thing. Yeah. So I was going to grad school just about the time that they were introducing what we now call online courses. And at the time it was really bad. It was nothing but scrolling pages of text with a few pictures scattered in. So it was bad, but I would argue that even that wasn't as bad as making people drive 300 miles and spend the night in bad hotels to have the EEO officer read to them. So I, I felt that they were really pretty equ equivalent experiences, both of them not great. But I saw that, that the online instruction could really solve a lot of our problems. They were always fussing at us about the travel costs associated with those things. It was costing, I think it was in the neighborhood then, of $400 a day 
when all was said and done between gas and travel and meals and, and, and they had to be out of work basically for two and a half days to go to this one half day of training, right? So I just saw that e-learning would solve a lot of our problems. I, was, I had gone into the master's program with a general interest in, I think the degree was probably called training and development back then. And I switched to technology-based training and I never looked back. So I was there in the earlier day, the real geeks were doing a little work with authorware. Blackboard was fairly newish. Um, stuff like Captivate and Camtasia and Articulate, we didn't even, we had just started having access to PowerPoint and projectors about that time. So that was kind of where I was starting. So I switched my major and I will tell you this, the day I first, I did a, my first web page, and it appeared on the World Wide Web, it was it was visceral. I, I remember now how exciting that was to be able to reach, you know, this whole broad undefined audience just by using Dreamweaver to upload a file, FTF, FTF upload. So, so that was how I got interested in e-learning. And then kind of by accident, because I was with the state, that was kind of light years ahead of everybody else. And because I was with the state, when they got ready to talk about e-learning and wanted to know about e-learning, I had just finished my master's in it. So I was sort of in the catbird seat. They invented a job for an e-learning specialist and there was nobody but me. Yeah, 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 I understand. So, so I was in that job for 15 years after, after that. They, you know, I moved into that position and that was the central training office. That was state personnel. So you know, we went from literally just pages of text to doing some basic PowerPoint converted to Flash to doing a little bit better than that, having some animation, having some real, you know, some meaningful interactions. And then from, from there, you know, we did start using uh, other tools. And about 2003, I met Jennifer Hoffman at InSync Training. I don't know if you all know Jennifer. Ah, Jennifer. Jennifer. Jennifer had written a book called The Synchronous Trainer Survival Book. And she wrote a book about doing, she was very new in the virtual training world. Nobody was using it. And we were, WebEx, I don't think existed yet. It may, if it did, it was new. It, 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 yeah, it was new. Yeah. yeah. She wrote a book. And Centra. That was, that was all about Centra. Yeah. And, and she wrote a book about things that go wrong and how to fix them. And it was just fabulous because yeah. it wasn't platitudes about how we ought to do things. It was like, this went wrong and this went wrong. One of the biggest um, programs of her career happened to occur on the same day that they released the Ken Starr report during the Clinton administration and the internet collapsed. I mean, you, you know, it was just, so I thought it was very helpful and it was very practical. And she and I have been friends for years now, but I started, I then saw additional interest in how we could then have online instruction that wasn't just people reading stuff because that's really all it had been at that point. So we started having really interactive virtual classroom stuff. And then again, when the state got interested in that, I, I had been doing it. So the, the agreement I had with her for many years, by the way, was that I would teach stuff. Like we did a lot of open enrollment classes like stress management and time management, personal, personal branding and that kind of stuff. And the deal was I, I would teach those for her on her platforms, but anybody in state government could also come for free. So we were able to deliver really nice programs and introduce our workforce, in fact, ahead of many of our training staff. Right. Um, doing it that way. So it just, you know, it just kept that and that and that. And then I have always liked technology. So when social media came along, again, I saw a solution to problems there where we could have people talking to each other, that it didn't all have to be monitored and overseen. It didn't have to all occur inside something like a shell, like a blackboard. So, you know, that was actually, I, I ended up doing a, a book on that. It was kind of the horse I rode for a long time with social media. Um, about that same time, am I talking too much? So let, I got six okay. questions before we get to this. So we, come, so we can come back to social media. Okay. Um, so a couple of verifications. The, the way it sounds, it sounds like 1997 or 98 when you created the first home page, your homepage. I think that, that was about right. I, I went to justice about 98. I was probably enrolled in the master's program about 99 or 2000 when that started. Yeah. Again, so you started in 99 or 2000 in the, in the, in your master's courses. Yeah. So uh, I was just trying to verify with the, the timing there. Cause I was an early blackboard person too. And web CT person, both of them. And there was somebody else called e-education from Jones okay. knowledge in Denver and real education, all these other two, I've used all of them. Um, so in North Carolina, so what university did you get your master's at? Was it North, it was North Carolina Car State? 
the or, master, everything I did was at North Carolina State. At the time, it was down the street from my office. It ended up not mattering because so much of it was online by the time I got halfway through it. But at the time, that was really the most convenient place I could go. Um, yeah, because training and development. Even, yeah, they had training and development there. And I can't remember the professors, but there was one guy who had his degree at IU. Got his degree. Do you remember your professors that you I don't, took? I don't. I, there was a there was a Barons. There was a Barrows. There was a. I, it, it's been too long, Kurt. I'd have to go okay. back and look. Yeah, just um, curious. I was just curious, um, but that's back in the day where it was all clicks, all online learning, e-learning is just clicking, 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 and the more clicks they thought, the better. Yeah, actually, there's a company in India created a tool called a learning management system called Clicks. Yes. And yes. I and ITT Technical Institute used that, and we evaluated that, and they that I they went under. But uh, so um, in North Carolina, just as a you know backdrop to all this. It's one of the states at the K-12 level that became a leader later, much later in the process. They had a lieutenant governor in North Carolina that was very interested in e-learning around 2012 or 11 or something like that. And they went from nobody doing e-learning, no kids doing e-learning, to in, in one or two years having half the system doing e-learning at the K-12 and then uh, within almost the whole entire system, they went jumped for like nobody to like 40,000 kids in the state of North Carolina doing e-learning to like almost 100,000. It's just amazing what was going on there. There were certain states, Hawaii, Michigan, Idaho, and North Carolina, and Florida, naturally Florida virtual schools, uh, were the leaders at the K-12 levels. So kind of, kind of surprising. Were you aware of any of that or involved in any of that? Because you worked for the state. I mean, I do you know any stories about I, that? I And it ties right back to where I was headed with the social media comment. Uh, the I worked the last 15 years that e-learning job was in the North Carolina Central Personnel Training Training Office. So I was I was and I could get to the governor if I really wanted to. I mean, I could I could get there and I had worked for most of them because they were AGs before they were governors. And so I had worked in the attorney general's office. So you knew um, these guys. You no, know, I knew these guys and I'd worked for a couple of them. But the one you're thinking of is a woman named Beverly Perdue. Uh -huh. And Beverly Perdue had been a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so she was very, very, uh, very technology savvy and she was very forward thinking and she understood, I think, again, how we could use this to solve problems. It wasn't just, isn't this cool and shiny and we should do this and let's go buy smart boards that no one will use. Yeah. She got it. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you the other thing about Beverly Perdue. So she became governor. She was elected governor. Um, and, uh, I have to say she wasn't a great governor. I liked her and she was a great human, but I don't know that that job was right for her. But Beverly, <laughs> Purdue, I was trying to introduce social media and it would sell all this. And of course, at the same time, we've got Charlie Bites My Finger is the only social media these people have ever heard of as they've seen it on YouTube and it's all a waste of time. And MySpace is nothing but kids. It was like they talk about TikTok now. It's nothing but kids waste of time doing them see thing. <laughs> <laughs> Beverly, Beverly Purdue who understood these things got on TV and said she expected state employees to use social media. It was the best way to, to connect with our tax paying public. We had no barriers, we had no blocks, we had no policies, we had no rules for years because of her. And the other thing she figured out was that if she, and she said, if you wanna know what I'm doing, you will check my Facebook page because that is the first place information will appear. Wow. And so sometimes I knew things before my own management did because they didn't look at Facebook. But the other thing is she figured out how to do that to circumvent the media. So the message was hers before they had a chance to massage it and change it and, and you know, um, corrupt it and put it all out. So it was a really interesting time to be working there when we had her in charge. I have to say it was a, it was great when all my friends are struggling just to do anything. I've got this woman saying, I expect y'all, I expect you to use this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, what's weird about this field or what's interesting and important about this field is you can be a, on the uh, one day working in the K-12 space and the next day working in the corporate space and the next day working in the government space. There are no barriers in reality. You know, no, I, no. I worked in the military. I was a you know, fellow in the Army Research Institute in the, in the Department of Defense, you know, a senior researcher. And one day, one day I wasn't, the next day I was, you know, and, you know, so you never know where you're going to end up. And you know, my last gig before the COVID, I was at Fort Sam Houston in, in San Antonio working with medics and, and actually all 
Air Force, Army, Navy, and all sorts of folks came. And they were very, I mean, the, 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 the military is the probably doing yeah. more cutting edge things than anyone else. Yeah. They're also doing some archaic stuff. They're on both ends. They're on a wide continuum, but they're always experimenting and always reading. They read everything. They want to know what, what works and what doesn't. The Navy, not so good. The Army, much really interesting what's going on. The Air Force is in and out. Um, the Coast Guard's done interesting stuff from what I see. Um, what I've seen out there, the Coast Guard, very interesting. They were doing synchronous before everyone else. They were in the Coast Guard guys be in the back of my room uh, during time. They were looking at what, what they're all talking to their students and giving them feedback. This is 20 years ago, you yeah. know? And yeah, well, um, Jennifer was part of that, I think. And you know, she married a Navy guy, I think, that she met in training. Doing uh-huh. training with the Navy, I think. And now, you know, we we have friends, you probably know them, who are doing VR work with military. Right. So, you know, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. Right. And, then, and then they read PowerPoint or you're doing VR stuff on a battlefield. <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's just such a wide gamut, just such a wide gamut of stuff going on. But you can you can move back and forth. So you were talking about what happened when you moved into social media. And then what did you do? You left uh, I, the state? No, no, no. I, I stayed with this. No, because they were letting me do what I wanted. I think I scared them a little. You know, I would just say, I'm going to go do this yada yada thing. And they're like, OK. Okay. Um, no, so I stayed with the state all that time. Um, so I wrote out my career 15 years. You have to have the equivalent of 30 years to retire. And I had that with a number of other things factored in. I didn't actually have to work that long. And if anybody told me I was going to stay with the state that long, and I said they were crazy, but I had health insurance and a pension coming. So uh, so I stayed put. So at the time, I was I had started working a lot with social media because um, it was fairly new. And I I wanted to do my dissertation on classroom trainer resistance to e-learning because that had been my whole life for so many years at that point. And I had a chair who said, <clears throat> that's not relevant. The market won't be, nobody be interested in that. I'm like, are you kidding? Are you kidding? Everybody. So, you know, I don't have to tell you the best dissertation is a done dissertation, right? So I switched it to, um, I had done a lot of work with social stuff. I had been involved in a very active community of practice for face-to-face trainers. We had face-to-face meetings. And I said, well, why don't I do it on Winger? Winger had a framework of the internal dynamics of community of practice. And I did my dissertation on that, which has served me very, very well as we start talking about social presence and collaborative learning and, and co- connectivism um, came up. So that ended up actually working in my favor. So the social media sort of turned into that. And I, I stayed with the state till I was there till 2017. And I went to the guild that the January after I left. So I took a month. So how many years did you have in with the state before you I had left? 27 years wow. in the state. Well, I went in when I was really young. I went straight not long after college with my English degree. Right. And, you know, I stayed with them. Um, and I so I went to the guild in January um, 2018. Uh, okay, so they, they they were looking for a director of research to replace Patty Shank, right? Patty right. Had left. Janet Clary had been in that job. Janet Vipon. I know her too, job. right? Yeah, you know everybody. Yeah, um, so I, I they're big shoes to fill. So I'm in Patty's old job, and I, I let it be known I was leaving. And it, it, you know, I thought I was going to miss the old work. I thought I was going to miss designing and sitting and working with stakeholders and trying to figure out what they really want. I turns out I don't miss it at all. Turns out I'm fine. <laughs> doing something different. Uh, so I went so, from the classroom to e-learning and now to research. So Oh, yeah. that, that's not the normal move <laughs> to, to go to research. At the, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell them about Patty Shank for a second and tell, tell my, the, my students about Jay Cross for a second, just so they are familiar with some names. I haven't mentioned Patty to, to <laughs> folks who, she, Patty's got a new book. Um, I forgot what it's on. Uh, multiple choice says, questions, I think. Um, yeah, on evaluation, I guess. Right, right, right. Um, well, well, Jay Cross is widely credited as sort of the old sage of our, our business. He was around forever before I came along. Right. He was the name in the business when I came along. It is rumored that he invented the term e-learning. I don't yeah. know if that's true, but he certainly popularized it. Um, he Jay was one was of very, many people who invented the same word. Jay was very, very interested in, in self-directed learning yep. and in informal learning. I think that he popularized the idea that you don't have to go sit in a chair and be read to to learn things. Right. Uh, and he was just he was just very well known. He was a, he wrote a good deal. He had a handbook or field book, I think he called it. That he it was in a constant state of beta. You it was online yep. and he was updating it all the time. And he was a very nice guy. I, I'm, I went to Jay's house one time and you know we Me all too. Speak, we all speak at all these conferences. He lives in Walnut Creek. 
And at the con at the at his cocktail party, he he made everybody wear somebody's conference name badge. I mean, he just had boxes of them. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. We all we all were other people. Um, yeah. And he, oh, he, he, was got, a he, had a, he had a bad ticker. He was a funny guy. He had a bad ticker. He, he had a, several heart attacks, and one finally yeah. got him. Did you say 2015, 16? Yeah, and in November 2015. Yeah. The yeah. folks, some of his colleagues, Jane Hart and Clark Quinn and right. Charles Jennings, and I, John Husband may still be part of them. The Internet Time Alliance offers a J Cross Award every year for yeah. um, sort of for people who push forward ideas of, of informal and social learning and that kind of thing. So he's well known. Patty Shank is an academic um, who ended up in a real practice. She does really interesting research. I think she publishes it for e-learning industry now. She was in my job before I took it. Um, but she does, she's done a lot of interesting writing lately on memory stuff and on assessments, like writing good multiple choice questions and evaluation, that kind of thing. And she writes, she's very practical and you can tell she actually had a job in this business, which yeah, is Patty, so, of everybody. Yeah. So Patty was at Stanford Research Institute right. before right. branching out on her own, doing really good work. And she's been at this, um, I don't know, she's still, she's still active, I think. So, cause she has the new book and whatnot. And Jay Cross had what was called the Internet Time Blog, and he would interview That's people right. in Silicon. Right. He would interview people in the Silicon Valley who are corporate leaders in the e-learning and, and technology space, and then he blog on it, and people would learn from him that way. Um, and he coined was one of pe many people who coined the word e-learning in the early days. Elliot Maisy is another person who coined the word e-learning, and if you go to Elliot Maisy, you can get on his um, on his newsletter called, um, I forgot what the name of it is now, but um, Learning Trends, I think. Yeah, at um, the moment, he's driving cross country in his Tesla. Tesla, yeah, yeah, I got his note today. He's, you know, we bought his conference though. We own the old conference. I don't know what he's gonna come up with next. We bought the learning conference in and, uh, no November in Orlando every year. Yeah, I know he, from time to time he develops conferences and then he sells them. He sells them, uh, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so have you maintained the 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 community that was that he built? When we're working on it, but then you know, COVID showed up. Oh yeah. COVID showed up. Um, I think. I don't think it was live. I may it may have been live the first year. I think it's been virtual since we took it, and that has brought changes. I have not been terribly involved in that. I try to stay in my lane. <laughs> yeah i don't want to get in the conference planning business so um, yeah. and, and, and this is being recorded that. and you don't want to get in trouble by saying something but i will say can you tell my students about now uh be a good time to tell them about what the e-learning guild is and what membership allows one to do or what oh. one gets if you're a member and and how the e-learning guild has evolved over the past you know, it's, it, you know, decade or two and your role in it. Well, um, all of that, all of that's more than I know. But let me just say the first way it's evolved is it is the learning guild now, not the e-learning guild anymore. Right. We drop that A, right? Um, the learning guild is intended to be, it, it began as the e-learning guild. And it was intended to provide support for people who were new with, um, or people who were working with educational technologies, people who were developing what we would call traditional e-learning uh, so lots of support for that. There's a good many conferences and workshops and lots of hands-on stuff. There is a uh, magazine called Learning Solutions Magazine that is updated constantly that offers what, what we intend to be practical, not necessarily too much theory or, or um, esoteric kinds of work. It's meant to be practical for people who do this kind of work. The last time I checked, we were moving up onto 100,000 members. Wow. The, the, wow. Basic, the basic membership is free and it gets you access to the public. Well, the, the magazine's online. Learning solutions you can get to anytime. The research reports, which I, I do one of those a month, are free with a free membership. And I'm, I'm going to show you the, the, the new one is publishing tomorrow. And it's about um, upskilling and what people in our business need to know about it. And it's kind of it starts off with a timeline of educational technologies our people have worked with. So the audience for most of its life has been um, e-learning people, mostly designers, ideas, some, you know, some developers, a few LMS administrators, often managers who usually have something to do with the, the design side. But we dropped the E a while back and we're trying to do a better job accommodating people who are doing traditional classroom. Um, we were just ahead of, of seeing everybody flee for virtual classrooms. So we've done a lot more lately to support them. 
So we do lots and lots of, of training for those folks and so, uh, effort to support those folks. So on the Jamboard, it's Jamboard number nine. If you mm -hmm. go to, you can put questions for Jane in there. So um, okay. go ahead and, and put some, if you have questions okay. for her as we're chatting okay. here. Um, I brought slides. You want to see the new report or pieces yeah. of it? Yeah. Be before you go to the slides, okay. I just have a name I'll throw out there, Brandon Hall. Um, so uh, is Brandon Hall involved in the Learning Guild or is this a separate organization? Not, not that I know of. I think that he's a separate organization. I don't even know. if Does he even own Brandon Hall anymore? I don't know. I think <laughs> yeah. it's a name. But, you know, they do awards. They do that kind of stuff. I haven't, honestly, I haven't kept up. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't hear his name when we mention stuff in the meetings. And, and so whatnot. you mentioned Janet Cleary before. Janet Cleary was in my- She was staff. involved in Brandon Hall when I did a report for Brandon Hall, I, I think. Yes, she was, yes, she was. Okay. She was at Brandon Hall a good a good while back. And now she's with, I'm trying to think, she, did she go back to them? That doesn't seem right. She, yeah. she went back, she was with Brandon Hall. She was with the Guild. She was with another job. She was with the Guild and she went back to that prior job, but I don't think it was the Brandon Hall job. So in the I'm corporate sorry, training I world- not, I was not prepared for the conversations about these people or I would have checked on stuff. Oh, no, it's okay. It's, it's better to have um, it off the cuff. But I in the-, in the a Big con consulting firm. Yeah, like it could- Like or it, something like that. It doesn't, it, I'm not sure. But I don't think yeah, it could be. Problem. But in the e-learning world, as things grew, people want recognition for their products. And so yeah. Brandon Hall stepped in. He's a former accountant like I am. Yeah. And he stepped in and provided the Brandon Hall Awards at conferences and it, it, at conferences like Elliot Macy's conferences or mm -hmm. others or the training and training East and training West or Telecon East. All these training conferences were occurring and so, someone filled a gap or filled a hole and he did that. And, and, and the e-learning guild filled a gap or filled a niche, you know, and then look, 100,000 people. That's huge. That's, that's, you know, that's, yeah, I think we're, so I think that's close. Now we were bought, uh, David Holcomb was the owner of e-learning of the learning guild and he sold 80% ownership to closer still media in London. So we're actually owned by them now. Wow. So, so there's they, so many, they, so there's so many work. jobs in this field. Oh my that, gosh. You know, oh my gosh. And it has been know. raining work during COVID. It has been raining work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we did studies on LinkedIn job postings and, or no, we did Twitter, Twitter first. We're doing LinkedIn now. It's just amazing when you look at it compared to the way things were 20 years. 20 years ago, there were jobs in this field. 10 years ago, there were jobs. But just the, the, the amount and the wide rangingness of the of the positions that are available. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it. Why don't you show your slides and we come back to the issue of jobs. So uh, why, don't, why, don't you why, don't, the why don't we, um, actually, that's part of the, that's part of what I brought to show. I was trying to pick up things that I thought would be useful. Can you see these? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I also did that review that you're describing. You said you talked about LinkedIn. I, I did a general review of jobs that were available. Um, oops, sorry. Well, and, you called uh, me a couple of years ago when I you were could, working that on that. Been, might have been this. So in 2015, Cami Bean, who we mentioned earlier, wrote a wonderful book called The Accidental Instructional Designer. And she did a review of sort of the big sites like monster.com, LinkedIn, some, some sites like that. And on the left, you see what we would call, and I think Kurt would agree, even until fairly recently, what, what would we, you would say was what a standard instructional designer job kind of looked like. Yeah. People might specialize, but the, this person, may they may or may not do needs analysis, task analysis, they write learning objectives, they're using the Addy uh, framework, they might know a little about graphic design, they're using authoring tools, right? This was the idea's job in 2015. The, the items on the right, are now in addition to those things on the left. Mm. When you start looking at job descriptions, and for most people, most people can't wear this many hats. Some of them wear a lot, but but you know, when you start looking at jobs or thinking about what interests you or what your specialties might be, there is so much out there and there's so much to choose from. Uh, and you know, one thing I would just recommend you keep in mind since we keep talking about jobs for, for folks who have share your interests. I was working for the state and I love technology and that's all great, but there are things the state is not ready for. They were usually five or six years behind other things. So I saw enormous um, application for AR and even VR. I particularly saw a lot of need for VR training for safety. Uh, we actually had two employees die falling off a scaffolding. And if we could have trained them to understand the feeling of falling from a hundred feet, 
yeah. using yeah. a virtual form. Maybe that would have helped. But I also knew the state was nowhere near ready for it. They were never paying for this, not anytime soon. And so it's great that that's there, but it really wasn't something I was going to get to do. If I wanted to do that, I would have had to leave that job, and that's fine. But I did, a, and that's kind of where the social stuff came in because it was free. We had a governor who was supporting it. And so I knew I could get uptake on that. I knew I could solve some problems that way. So, you know, realistically, do you want to stay where you are? Is there a particular field you like, like aviation or automotive or healthcare um, or, or um, you know, regulatory stuff or energy stuff? You know, think about what that field is going to be wanting. Um, Caterpillar Equipment, by the way, does huge, cool stuff with VR. Right. Right. But they don't do it in the training department. Many organizations that do a lot of VR are outsourcing that or they've got marketing is doing it. Marketing and research are leading that because they want people to have sort of um, hands on internal experiences with the products. And that's not necessarily what the training department is. So what you do may end up being in another part of the organization, too. So there's a lot out there. And I think it's a really exciting time. And there are some people who specialize now in just one aspect of, um, of these kinds of jobs. I think there's gonna be huge demand for people who can manage data, who know what to do with data in our business, who can help interpret the data that's coming in, um, who can understand what to do with um, it and with AI as we start to get the, the kind of data, the amount we need for that. <clears throat> so I think there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity. Same is true of the university setting. Many mm -hmm. students are getting jobs in medical schools and business schools and, and public health and, and, and not just in schools of education um, or training departments or whatever. Um, the, you know, the applications of the, the, all these skills, they're, they're needed as, as MBAs go online, the business schools need to hire these people. And the same is true of the you know, nursing master's programs and, and, and other things. So uh, public health degrees, huge in, in, in online uh, learning. So, so yeah, the, the, there's a world out there that, that that is looking for skills. And now what's happening because of that is undergraduate degrees in the field now. Yes. Um, yes. So in the state of Florida uh, and in Mississippi, uh, undergraduates are majoring now. And where Sunme is from, she's in Korea. Korean, they've been doing that for a long time. Undergraduate degrees in Korea and Taiwan and mainland China. That's, you know, dime a dozen. But in the U.S., this is a new thing. This is yes. a brand new thing. It is. And, um, you know, I... Uh... I would encourage people to give some thought, um, to take a look at some of the literature. There's you know, a lot of the literature on workplace training. You know, I'm dealing more with workplace, Kurt deals more with academic. A lot of the workplace literature on training and development comes from healthcare because yeah. they've got all these doctors they're trying to teach. They're trying to teach people performance like saving a life in the moment. Um, they do a lot of work with simulations, sim, you know, sim, sim, working with patients. They do a lot of work now with diversity, equity, inclusion. So that's a good place to, to sort of look around just at the literature and see what people are doing, what kind of things uh, are, are going on. But there's, I think there's, there's lots and lots of work out there. And if you're lucky with some of these newer things, kind of like I did, you can sort of invent your own job. Yeah. Know what you're, <laughs> what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I yeah think you're not being slotted into something that someone, so when I was an accountant, that's what you're being slotted and you're taking the place of another auditor or another tax accountant. Right, you're just, right. you're, you're repeating the same old train monkey kind of job, you know, <laughs> add up a phone book, but no, in this field, you can determine what you're doing. You have some, some self, you know, some say in these jobs based on your skill base, based on your interest, because right? there's so many skills needed. You can kind of rotate yourself yeah. into the, you know, uh, like you did in effect. Yeah, right. I, I, well, I was able to sort of follow my interests and I was ready, you know, there's a there's an old line from Wayne Gretzky that says skate to where the puck is going to be. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's sort of like, you know, I knew I could invest a lot of my time learning about VR, but I also knew it, it, they weren't going to call on me for that. What I got called on was virtual classroom and social and anything like that. I see that we have a what I was going to say, though, before I forget this, I, I do think one thing that's missing from a lot of professional preparation and I don't know that it's a college course, but I think that that most of the people I know in this business, especially the newer ones to it, they need to be better at negotiation and assertiveness. You can, you can get slotted into the role of being an order taker. And I've seen people develop bad stuff because of that. I've seen them develop things that not only don't solve a problem, but it makes it worse. 
And then the stakeholders like, well, we asked training to do it and they, then they blew it, you know, so you don't want to be in, in that role. There's a question here. There's a question. The let's, let's find out who's got that first question there. I've got it. Oh, I've got it. it? Just, Some industries it? that are more open to online versus in person. Did anybody it's, want to it's Katie's questions. Okay. Katie, you want to restate it for um, well, I Jane? It. I got it. Well, let's get it. I want to get Katie on, on, okay. on recording here. Okay. Go ahead, okay. Katie. Um, thank you for being here. I'm interested if there are certain industries that are more open to um, using online learning than others. And I guess the opposite of that's true. Are there some industries that are still extremely reluctant ah. to do that? I would say yes, if it was 2020. If it was January 2021, my <laughs> answer to that would have been yes. My answer in March 2022 is they had to figure out how to do it another way. Um, I think that, yes, for a very long time, um, human resources loves face-to-face -face stuff. I think many, many cases in most industries probably would say they preferred face-to-face. Family-owned businesses tended toward it. Um, Sales, I will say that sales is probably still the exception. Salespeople just by their nature like being social. They like being together. They want to go to conferences. They want to have classes during the day. They want to have dinner together at night. They want to party, right? Um, as, as far as particular industries, in my experience, um, places with, and I want to be careful how I say this, frontline blue collar workers like construction, like retail, um, I'm thinking about like grocery store clerks, like, um, like, like factory settings, automotive, uh, assembly, those kinds of things have, have always machinery equipment, have always tended toward wanting face-to-face. -face. Sometimes that's content driven. People think that you can't teach communication or listening or supervision or, um, or DEI kinds of stuff unless people are in a room together. And I would say that they learned in 2020 that that wasn't necessarily the case. Now we have done some research on it that I didn't bring with me tonight, but what we saw was an enormous shift from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, especially virtual in early 2022, about the time COVID hit. And we are seeing that that number is likely to remain high. There are a lot of organizations that responded to our surveys about that who said, we figured out how to do this virtually. Everybody's happier with it. The, none of the employees have complained. And so we expect that it sort of looked like a, a big sharp peak and now down to here and leveling off. They expect that, that, that I don't know if anybody is expecting to go all the way back to face to face, but I want to talk to you about a particular case. There's a, a person that um, is in a, our last month's report about learning leaders. Her name's Heidi Matthews, and she works for Terracon which is like safety, they do safety testing to make sure the concrete is strong enough to hold up the parking deck, things like that. And they do a lot of work with that kind of staff, you know, staff who are, are out in the field, who are in vehicles, who are working with, with products like that. And she said that for months after COVID hit, they were moving mostly things to virtual, they could not get together in person and management just insisted that they wait to onboard staff because everybody had to be together to watch a video. There's a famous video that I've never seen. I believe it's about a guy named George. There's a man who had several workplace injuries, kind of gruesome, who now does a lot of public speaking of telling his story about getting hurt at work. And because management insisted that they had to sit together and watch this live, literally people were not being trained to be safe on the job because they had to watch a safety video in a room together. It wasn't even that the video couldn't be online, it was they had to watch it together. And finally, Heidi said, you know, the video is still compelling even if the person next to me isn't crying. <laughs> so she finally convinced them that everything, you know, that including that could be virtual, could be delivered another way, but it was, it was hard one. I mean, people are really attached to face to face. So I'm giving you a very long answer. I would say, I don't know that it's specific to industry, but it was certainly specific to L&D. I think there was overall a preference for face-to-face -face and a begrudging acceptance of virtual if there was a cost savings to it. But I think that that's changed now. I think they've had to learn that um, virtual classroom and that's as opposed to just a standalone tutorial. That's still another kind of, of thing that they're not, they're not thrilled with. So I think virtual classroom felt like, you know, facilitator led instruction felt felt closer to face to face for them.
Well, I have a little correction there. Um, you said it kind of fast. You said, in, uh, just for the record here, for people watching this recording, you said in early 2022, there was a huge shift to first of all. I mean, you went oh, no, 2020. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So I just wanted to just clarify that because I, I knew I knew what you meant. We all know what you meant. Just in case someone watching the recording later right. well, might pick that up. Um, well, the, shift, other the, shift was, the shift was actually in 2020. It was 20. It was March right. 2020 that we right. locked down and things happened very fast. And I saw us moving from what I thought of at the time as emergency remote teaching. Yeah, we yeah. just got to get it online to a, a horrible are, term. A horrible um, term. More thoughtful yeah. things. Things now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've talked about that in our field all the time, this emergency remote teaching notion. And, um, you know, it's an EDUCAUSE article, uh, EDUCAUSE review or EDUCAUSE quarterly. And it's got the most hits of pretty much any article in distance education in the in the past century, you know. But uh, Barbara Lockie at Virginia Tech and someone named Hodges wrote this article. Yeah, yeah you, you've got that. It's everyone had it. It was two weeks into the pandemic. I started my podcast show or my colleagues and I started Silver Lane for Learning on March 21st. I started running every day. Since then, I've been running 707, 18 days today was. It's that, so 718 days ago, where the pandemic started. So imagine that, you know, it's been a long time, you know. It has. Uh, um, it has. Do we have more questions on the, on the, on the jam? So who's asked the second question? Who wants to jump in there on production skills? Is that Linda? Go okay. ahead, Linda. Yeah, yeah um, I feel like um, because I work in industry and um, <clears throat> I think that was the one of the one of the things that sort of hit me, you know, sideways was that uh, it's not sometimes they value the graphic design and the video production skills more than they do the instructional design skills that you have and or they expect you to have both um and i i just i feel like there's there's really a lot of pressure if you are in industry to it's it's you know at times it almost seems like marketing <laughs> um what yeah, you're doing yeah, but right. um yeah i just wonder you know if you're if you're just graduating with an instructional design degree and you're going out and getting a a position in industry how 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 should you go about gaining those skills I would say the first thing, and I'll show, I'll give you the link before we leave tonight. We did a video report. Jonathan Halls wrote a video report for us in December that addresses a good deal of that. And he's the better person to ask than I am, but he did write about that a lot. You know, some of it is deciding what you want to do. I mean, we're not all artists. And so that's the first, the first thing. Um, some of it is deciding whether you want to learn to work with dedicated software or equipment. Um, for most of what you're talking about, the training may not be happening in, in, a, in a training setting. I mean, it may not be offered by an ATD or Learning Guild or any of that. You may, you may actually want to go to the people who make the camera, the people who make the software, do tutorials with them and see where that leads you. Uh, but, you know, something else I want to say, because you're, you're right, when you started out saying uh, it, it feels like they want you to do so many things, I am kind of hoping we're almost at the tipping point on that where the person isn't expected to wear 17 hats because that has always been the case, you know, rather than get somebody who's dedicated to work with data or get somebody who's dedicated to work with graphics. It's like, oh, Jane can draw okay, or you're good with color or you, you went to grad school, you had statistics and not just keep adding that on. I think that speaks a little bit to the assertiveness I mentioned before. I think um, HR needs to be better informed about what these jobs are and what's realistic to do. But I'll tell you, when we did the one I mentioned uh, earlier about what, what people, what skills they were using in their real job and looking at uh, what job descriptions included, I saw a job description for someone who needed to be, they needed to be proficient in articulate, they needed to be a good stand-up classroom producer, they need to be skilled with, I think it said Zoom, something virtual, and they were gonna run the employee blood drive. You know, it, it, we've got to we've got to start. I think drawing some lines and saying if you need that much video or graphics, we need to hire somebody or learn to outsource for that. But um, but anyway, I think that to your answer, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of training available for that. Whether you need to go get certifications in it, I don't know. I have not found that employers really ask for that. Uh, being able to develop some good prototypes and whatnot. The the thing is you have to be careful not to end up chasing that forever because the cameras change and the software changes 
and yeah. the approach has changed. You know, for a while we were all hot on on the animated on the videos with the with the hands that write. I can't think of what they were called, the common craft videos. And then everybody was hot for cartoony animation like Go Animate and and Beyond and stuff. So I, I think I think I would be I would probably follow my interest and learn to do the things I wanted to do and then you know kind of figure out what what you think your gifts are what you think your talents and your specialties are and make those work for you rather than just try to develop a lot of random skills because I'll tell you what half the time those job descriptions they just copied the last one or they read what somebody over at, at Google was hiring. I see a bunch of nodding heads. They don't really even know what they're asking. I, I would see things like needs to be proficient and captivate, articulate, or PowerPoint. I'm like, those, <laughs> you know, those are not those are not necessarily um, equal equal things. But I, you know, I would I would probably, if I were near shoes, look for some free stuff, some online tutorial kind of stuff. Uh, rather than invest a lot in it, if it might, you know, all change again in a week or two. And, and you may find out, you may find out you really love something. I didn't know I was going to like coding. I thought that was a real geeky thing to do. I ended up kind of enjoying it. So. So I want to let, uh, assume has got her hand up. I want to let her jump in here. Sume, go ahead. Well, actually, thank you for your time. And I may miss something that's because i missed it the first time so actually i'm really curious about how to get your job in the first place without any experience in you know instructional designer that's because actually 10 years ago actually at the time i graduated from graduate school and i tried to find a you know job as an instructional designer but finally i failed so actually I got a job different one. So I just curious, how did you get it? And then right so now you are a director. If, well, before she jumps in, you have to tell her what, where you are now and where um, you right went to, where, 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 so where you went to, where did you get your master's at? What, or what, was it in uh, Seoul? No, actually in San Francisco State, yeah, San Francisco okay. State University. So I major in instructional technology and I got a master's degree. And after that, I tried to apply for a lot of company, you know, and university and school. So I remember that almost 60, you know, company and schools, you know, I applied, but finally I failed and I gave up. And then, yeah. and then I got a job from one. So right now it's, I'm mobile app developer. So actually I'm programming. So totally different build. Right. So I'm just curious. Oh, but, why I failed and but, others but, are success. But, but you, so you, you, you still haven't told her where you are. So where are you pro, uh, mobile? Uh, where are you a mobile app person? At where? Stanford University. At yeah. that little place called Stanford. Okay. Yeah, so, that. That she's, she's, and she's <laughs> a she's a doctoral student in the program, and she's about ready to dissertate or take her qualifying exam. So just give a little background before you answer her question. Yeah. Right. So you're slum, you. slumming it over at Stanford. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do you at the time did you have a portfolio? Yeah, I have. You did. Yeah, you I have. Anybody, you couldn't get anybody to look at that. You know, I'm not sure why, but actually, the, some company told me that you have no experience, and then yeah. you have a totally different background. That's because before I worked as a software engineer, you know, at the, you know, actually Samsung Electronics. So they said, oh, you have a totally different background. You can not make it, something like that. And others, I think that they really like it. But actually, at the final you know, stage, I just got rejected. So I don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you the first thing that happens, because I worked for um, the state, the central personnel office, is that a woman named Brenda, and that was her name, was Brenda, would screen those applications. And if the job posting said three to five years of experience, they would look at yours and go like this, and they would look at somebody with five and go like that, and they would look at somebody with four and go like, that was the first thing is you were probably getting screened out. I would say, and I think most of my peers will agree, it is really critical to get involved in professional communities. If there's an ATD chapter in your area, um, I, I interviewed a guy for our, our report last month who said at least half his new hires have come from people he met at ATD. At meetings and stuff. Join the guild, participate in Twitter chats. There's Twitter chats. I run one on Thursday nights with Dave Kelly, who's the CEO of the Learning Guild. Um, get your name out there, show links to your stuff when you can, offer up blog posts if you have them, have a link to your portfolio, 
but get involved in professional associations as much as you can. And I know that's not comfortable for everybody, but I was involved in a very active community of practice. As I said, I ended up doing my dissertation on it. I would credit them with a lot of the fact that people knew my name. Um, when I was looking at to get into other things, going to ATD meetings, helping to host them, uh, offering to do some presentations for them, showing some little technical thing you know how to do, what you're doing right now might lend itself very well to that. The Learning Guild has has face to face, but also virtual gatherings. Uh, but I, I can't recommend enough the value of networking some and making sure people know you in that way you can. Well, what I found, we did a report on degrees, I don't know, six months ago, maybe. And, and we talked with a number of people who didn't have any degree because that's often the first thing the job requirement says, right? They want an undergraduate, they want a master's degree now. And I had, I talked to some people who had no degree, who had never gone to college. And every one of them said they had moved into the training department from another job in the company, right? One of them, they were launching software and he ended up being kind of gifted at, at training. And suddenly they said, let's make him a trainer. Right. Um, or or you work on a project with someone else and they like you, but you have to you also have to let it be known what you want and that you're looking to move into training. But it, it can be done. But I don't think I'm sorry, but I don't I don't hear from people that real traditional practices like just blind submitting an application and going maybe getting an interview works very well. I will tell you the state when I left the state, our, our administrative assistant had moved to another job. I'm talking about somebody who answered the phone. I mean, we had a classroom, a building full of classrooms. People came to classes. She answered the phone. She told people where the classes were. She told them where the coffee maker was. That job probably paid $28,000, $29,000. We had 400 applications for that position. And you know, out of that pile, 30 people probably were exactly identical. I, I mean, you know. So figuring out a way to get yourself noticed, uh, I think working from another part of the company you're already in might be the way to do it. Um, networking more. If you've, got, uh, if you've got online samples or portfolios, put them up there. If you're doing anything with Articulate, they have a wonderful community called eLearning Heroes. Do you know about that? Okay, Articulate does weekly challenges called um, the eLearning the, the e Hero Challenges, and it'll say, Build a quiz using no words. Build a quiz in three languages. Build a mix and match on um, brain surgery. And, and a bunch of people will do this on their own on their own time and suddenly names start to emerge and you start to recognize people. You notice who's helping other people. Articulate, by the way, is entirely remote and they're valued now at a billion, billion dollars. They, are in, they don't have an office, so it doesn't matter where you live. Billion dollars? That's good. Thank so you. Billion dollars. That's storyline, right? So, well, uh, that's one of their products, but they advertise so, on city buses. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the guy, <laughs> I, I was walk, checking out of a hotel in London 10 years ago. I was at the BET conference, British Ed Tech conference, mm -hmm. and, and gave a talk in the theater of the round there. And the guy behind me says, Indiana, you're from Indiana. He saw my, my luggage or something. My daughter goes to Indiana, one thing led to another, and he's the brother of the president of Articulate. He says, I'll come to campus. I'll give you guys Articulate storyline for free and all this. And That's uh, a good offer. That's generous because that's not yeah. cheap stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was, that was kind of cool. So I'll, I'll add one thing to your comment okay. in that. Um, so you went to San Francisco State soon. I forgot about that. So, you know, um, a student of mine, uh, he came to Indiana in 1999. A lot, there's a pipeline from San Francisco State to Indiana, or there had been a pipeline of students that came. And the, one of the guys, in my, his name is Steve Schatz, and he got his PhD. He, he, was a, he was working in the Silicon Valley before coming to Indiana. He says, oh, what you got to do, Dr. Bonk, is you've got to give workshops at training conferences. That's how you get your name. So workshops are, you know, a popular topic and you have a pre-conference workshop or a post-conference workshop. I recommend the pre-conference workshops where people show up a day early. A lot of times they don't stay a day late because they just have to head out to something someplace else. But they'll come a day early. And if you make an impression on people and you get a, you, they'll recommend you for time after time to other things. So that was that was a huge uh, thing for me anyhow. Uh, was was providing that or just look for opportunities like that where you can contribute to a conference 
But Prisca came late because she was in another meeting and we were talking about the e, the learning guild. It's no longer e-learning guild. It has a free membership, Prisca. You can join that. And then they have re- reports. And Jane showed us one of the reports that's coming out tomorrow, Jane? Yep, or, it's out tomorrow. Um, yeah. What's the title of the report? One thing I Just, say, but I want, I want, I want, I'm sorry to interrupt, but one thing I want yep. to say about the conference is the guild is committed to yep. having 10% new pre- presenters at every event. So new people can get in. You don't have to be a well-known name to get in. And yeah. people who offer a case study, how I solved a real problem, those do not offer introduction to storyline. We get a thousand <laughs> proposals, <laughs> right? But people love case studies. If there's a panel you're willing to be on, be getting your name out there and giving back. I mean, when I first logged on tonight, that's what Dr. Bonk was talking about was connectivism yeah. and giving back to the community. You know, you do get back what you give. So contributing, contributing something can... Um, can help quite a lot. I had another, I had something else I wanted to, to mention. I don't remember what it was now, but, um, but, but being willing to step up a little bit and be, be part of that is, um, is very helpful. Helping people if they're struggling with software or something or helping somebody like, I think it was Linda who was asking about um, media and getting more skilled in that. We have another question. Um, I, before you go to- I, I don't, I don't know about LinkedIn learning badges. I will tell you that when I did my review of jobs, and Dr. Bonk may have found something differently. I didn't see that anyone cared about badges or certificates unless the certificate was in. I'll tell you the one thing everybody asked for was project management skills. Every single job posting, I think, one of project management. But it, they specified a degree, which I would argue isn't always, I, I think it's just become a convenient filter. I'm sorry. But I think sometimes asking for a master's, you know, it used to be everybody wanted a a BS in something and now it's a master's. I'm worried about the day it's going to become, well, we need to get a doctorate now just to sort all these applications out. (laughs) Um, uh, I can't speak to that. I don't think it hurts. I mean, I don't think any self-development hurts. And I will tell you, the new report that's coming out tomorrow, people over and over said, "You, you need to look after your own development. Your manager's not doing that. Um, managers don't know how to do that. They said, if there's something that interests you, if you think, if you know where your industry is headed, kind of like I did, you you need to look after yourself. Don't wait for them to say you need to go. Don't wait to get sent to something. Try to seek out stuff for yourself as much as you can, um, even if it's sometimes on your free time. Well, whose question was that about badges? Uh, I don't. Oh, yeah. yours, Priska. Do you want to add to that, Priska? Um. I wasn't sure if I was muted. Um, yeah, no, I, I I don't have much to add. I just wanted to know because there's it's something that's being emphasized in my program at the moment. So I wanted to know if it was something that uh, you guys were looking at as well on the other side, um, the LinkedIn badges. Yeah, that's not, it's not really my wheelhouse. I didn't see it when I was doing my review, but Dr. Bonk's been doing one too. He may know something else. Well, we had a, one of my grad students come in a week or two ago who's doing a dissertation on it. Zion came in. Priska, you want to tell Jane where you're, where are you working at? Um, what do you mean? I'm not sure. Your, your job? current job. Your current job. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I teach fashion design in Miami-Dade College. Uh, nice. I've been doing that for about six years. Nice. So Jane, one thing I was uh, I want to get is on record here. What's the title of the report that comes out tomorrow? And do you want to flash it back on screen because Prisca missed it the, the little little bit there, so she can see it. Yeah, there we go. So upskilling. So the, the report that's coming out tomorrow is upskilling for L and D uh, practitioners, and the reports come out. I do one of these a month. Again, we have a lot of other publications. We do white papers. We have a magazine, Learning Solutions Magazine is, is constantly refreshed. It's new content all the time. And that's available just clicking, just go to learningsolutions.com. But um, the reports require a membership, but the membership's free. And mostly that's so we can track who is actually downloading them. Uh, it's not it's not really, and we don't really do anything else with that information, but, but the reports are free with a free membership. And that gives you access to a few things. As you start paying, you get discounts for the conferences, you get access to the Learning Leaders Alliance. I mean, I think there are different tiers that I don't actually keep up with. So this will be out tomorrow, but all the reports are available at learningguild.com. Recently we did, and I've mentioned several of these, we did one with Learning Leaders last month who were talking about where they find new hires and what they expect and you know how they train them. We did one on video. We've done a recent one on adaptive and personalized learning. That's by Chad Udell. We have done, um, 
uh, one on degrees for learning and development professionals. And I want to tell you this, I, I don't, Kurt, is this a master's level course or doctoral? It's student? an introductory for the master's or doctorate. Okay. You know, it could um, be an either. I will tell you that not a single person who got a master's degree said they regretted it. Every single one said that it was worth their time. You want to flip through a couple pages just so we can see what's in there? You know, I didn't bring the whole report. That was the oh. degrees report. I just brought a couple of screenshots for you because it was still in design yesterday. I needed stuff that um, didn't have watermarks on it. I was talking with people about their own experience. You know, we talk about the timelines, um, yeah. about what they were doing in the 90s, what they were doing in the 2000s, what we saw changing, what kind of popular topics. And I will tell you that the, the single biggest change that everyone said was the the shift to the idea that people in our business weren't only there to develop courses. And in many cases, that's not even the primary work anymore. We have so yeah. many digital approaches. We have so many other ways of providing performance support. Now, this is for workplace. Um, yeah. So many other ways of getting quick information to people. I think COVID helped people hear the clock ticking about the hours that we spend sometimes in training that really could be done in much less time. And they all said that they welcome that change, that they understood that, that it's not just here's three objectives, sit down and build a slide deck about it. So well, yeah, that really goes back there. to your $400 a day example, where you there, you were talking about an individual would spend, in effect, it would cost the company 400 bucks a day for one person. And the, the move to blended or to fully online environments was what inspired you to get into this field. Mm -hmm. And that was also what led to my 2006 book on the handbook of blended learning, because IBM talked about that. Microsoft talked about that, Oracle, Sun Micro, all of them talked about the different blended learning models they had to try and save money. Whether to use a bookend model for online at the beginning and the end, they shortened or compressed the time in the middle. The same is true of the Army and the Air Force and the military organizations. So something had to change. The, the yeah. amount of money being spent on food, lodging, transportation, just time away from the office uh, was just uh, astronomical. And uh, people needed in the case of uh, Microsoft, they needed to have a lot of leaders being trained in a shortened fashion because the you know company was growing and they needed young, young leaders. So leadership training was a huge thing was going yes. on back yes. back in the, you yes. know, it still is, so. And, uh, and there, there are ways we can get that, that human touch in now. We, we are better at, at managing virtual classroom. We're better at helping people connect in that, in that experience. But I'll tell you, I, I was in the classroom training business. I was face-to-face -face and I enjoyed it. There's a lot of dead time associated with face-to-face -face training. You get about oh, yeah. three windows a day, but if the thing starts at 8.30, well, it's still 8.35, 8, even if you're a great manager, it turns into 8.30, 8.40 before you get started. And then there's gotta be a break and that's never really 10 minutes long. And then there's lunch and that's never, I mean, th the days just, th th there's two or three hours sometimes of dead time, even in a, in a good, well-managed face-to-face event. And it's just crazy given given how we feel about things. And honestly, I, I'm still talking to companies who say they are not allowed to have meetings in person still. So wow. they've had to find other ways to do it. And that wow. their companies are not paying for travel. So, you know. So I've got a couple of questions left. I, I, I told you we'd only be an hour. We've just about come to the hour. We didn't start right at seven o'clock. So, you know, we have a few minutes left. I want to make sure my, my students here don't... Uh, so I want to exhaust their questions first. So I want to go back to you. And I, I guess you can click soft share. Shai Sha Ying, you haven't uh, said anything yet. Did you want to uh, jump in and ask any questions here? Wait, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm always thinking about questions. Um, as we are using more online learning uh, tools, how to improve the interact, interaction between instructor and lear, learners, especially in for that in synchronous um, courses. Yeah, because most of us just use some um, tools like a discussion board, but um, maybe it is not uh, very efficient sometimes. So um, especially in during this pandemic period, how to improve the uh, interaction yeah uh, is there any uh, effective techniques or uh, methods for that uh, are you asking and you're asking specifically about asynchronous training um yeah it's yeah. funny but i wrote a book about that she's talking about synchronous actually 
You're talking about, you're talking about synchronous. Synchronous, um, right? Uh, uh, synchronous. Synchronous, right. okay. Um, there's, a, there's a lot you can do. We did a report, um, in one of our, big, our, be, our biggest, pop, most popular reports in 2021 on evidence-based practices for virtual classroom instruction. And we talk a lot about developing social presence and what the instructors can do to help facilitate better interaction. Uh, a couple of things are that you have to let people talk <laughs> right? You need to give them something that's interesting to talk about and let them talk. A lot of times people who have been traditional trainers want to over facilitate and over manage conversation and they don't just let people experience things. So I think putting them, if you've got a large group, putting them into smaller breakouts can help with that. You know, having just a few people in a, each room, uh, giving them an interesting topic to discuss without a lot of room around it uh, is interesting. But you have found out, it sounds like, from what you're saying, that people in a synchronous environment tend to talk to the instructor. Like, I ask you a question and you answer me. And it's happening tonight. You all aren't talking to each other. You talk to me. Dr. Bonk asks a question. He asks you. You talk to him. You talk to me. Right. That's not really how this is set up. But finding ways to help people interact with one another. Uh, can be helpful. I have an article about that. Let, let me find it for you real quick. I think we can do this while we talk. Um, but there, there are a good many techniques. I would direct you back to, you if you missed it at the beginning, Jennifer Hoffman runs NSYNC training, and that's spelled NSYNC, I-N-S-Y-N-C. And she has a blog and a community of, of practice that's based on Facebook. And that's almost all they ever talk about, is how we can get people more engaged and more involved. Um, and she was one of the early leaders in this, and she had several books in the early days uh, that were very popular. Um, I'm on her, you know, I get her newsletters and subscribe, and she's always been great. She's always been very helpful, too. You can contact her and she'll respond, you know. Right. And yeah, you can. And let me let me show you. I'm going to do a, a quick share so you can see this. Um, one of the techniques I have found useful as a facilitator is called discussion mapping. I used to do this a lot when I was a stand-up trainer. And basically, this shows a classroom. And the X's, I'm up at the front. I'm, I'm the green X's up at the front. Above me are the number of times I told someone something and the number of times I asked someone. And you can see that asking outnumbered telling about two to one. The green X's are where I moved around the room. The red indicates people talking back and forth to me and the red curves around the edges are people talking to each other. So I would say not even knowing much about this, that this was very interactive, that people were very engaged with me, that they were very engaged with each other, that I was not just standing there lecturing. All right, and this is how that same conversation looks in a virtual classroom, like here's a Zoom gallery. I can see who isn't participating much, who didn't say anything the whole time. Uh, looks to me like maybe Letitia talked a lot more than everybody else. That might be something to look at. Maybe she's dominating. Is this making sense? Do you understand what I'm showing you? Um, up here, there was yeah. a, lot, a lot going on between a couple of people, kind of maybe too much, too, too many asides. So it can help you see what your interaction's looking like and where maybe you need to draw people out more, maybe where you need to settle some people down, maybe where you're talking too much. You can see up here again at the top left, I'm up here again, I'm still telling less than I'm asking. So I would say this is a really useful technique. Okay. I'll, put it, I'll put it in the chat um, just to kind of help you see, because sometimes things I think are better than you think they are. Um, but I have found that, Thank that you. For whatever, yeah, for whatever reason, people tend to be trainers. Trainers don't much like to turn people loose and let them just talk. They seem to feel like they need to, to manage that or, or over control it. They don't. I mean, we've seen companies who think the lawyers have to vet every blog comment. Right. Right. So, you know, <laughs> letting people talk and giving them yeah. something they can talk about and just sort of sitting back can be can be helpful. So I'll be respectful of Jane's time. Um, does we have one or two final questions for her tonight? Uh, anyone want to jump in? Um, Soon May looks like she's got another question. I know the look on her face when she has questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
I'm just curious, that's because my topic is peer interaction in online learning, but my focus is asynchronous. <laughs> so it's a little bit Tell different, her, but... The topic for her dissertation, maybe, right? <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. So are you doing a lot of reading on, um, on social presence? Oh, yeah, I read yeah, that one. See why, so yeah, see why. And I did do, you know, my yellow book, the social media for trainers book is old, but I dealt with Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, blogs and wikis mm -hmm. um, and how you manage discussion and encourage discussion in those settings. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot you can do with that. Again, I think some of it is finding the people who will talk, encouraging them to help the others and finding something that's interesting to talk about. I had a co-worker one time who just demanded that IT build him this interactive discussion board so state employees could discuss um, the details of the sexual harassment policy. You know what? Nobody wants to talk about the sexual harassment policy, but the people in HR, the employees don't care to talk about that unless they're about to sue somebody, in which case you don't want to your discussion board. You know, nobody wanted to talk about it. I mean, it just sat there and he had all these rules for participating. Um, nobody ever used the thing, and I don't know how much time and money they put into it, but, you know. Oh, that was so interesting. That's because last week, I took the, you know, actually interactive, you know, sexier harassment mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you know, course, and last week, that actually, it took a full hour. It was so I that so I was very moved. Oh my god, it's really great. So how do we do that? You know, actually, first place I thought this. Oh, I just check and then you know just anyway pass. That's because it was requirement for me, right? But actually, started to watch that video. But actually, it's interactive. So every time it asks my you know opinion. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? And then I type it and the wrong you go back and then i have to go back and then to watch it again and then finally i got a, you know right answer right so it was really interesting you know i just feel like watching some drama you know so yeah that was a really yeah. great idea i like it i think it was I interesting think that been, you that been that a, idea that would have been a lot better than just having a discussion board and saying people talk about it right yeah. with no no prompting yeah. or anything exactly that, that would be easier yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to, you know, talk about that one, you know, publicly. So that was a really great way. Just yeah. anyway, asynchronous, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, right when you mentioned your book, I had a note here saying, before you end, Kurt, you make sure that you ask Jane about her books and ask her, what's her favorite book that she's written? What's been, what's been the most successful book that you've written and why? Uh, and then I'll ask you a second question, right, uh, connected to that. Since you just made this big decision to shift careers, what's been your biggest success story that you want to share with us? So, uh, book related, what's your, okay. what's the, what are you most proud of, and why? And then, in terms of ch your change in the career that you made, what are you most proud of or successful, and why? Um, the the best selling book was uh, Better Than Bullet Points. It was How to Create Good E-Learning with PowerPoint which argued that you can do a lot of things with PowerPoint if you just learn to use it well, like you can do animations, you can do interesting interactions. Uh, and this was when most of the software was not as easy to use. You know, the software's gotten easier. Storyline used to be pretty challenging and it's, it's much easier now. Uh, and that made it to two editions. I think one of the most useful books, everybody who has this book tells me they love it, was a book of tips, tools, and techniques for trainers called Form Analysis to Evaluation. And the publisher charged $70 for it. Mm. And so it sold okay, but it's out of print. I'm trying to get the rights back so I can offer it again in some other format. Uh, mm. it's, it, they never even did a digital version. It was on CD and, and paper. And it was a big book. It was expensive for them to make. But um, And the latest book is a book called Show Your Work. It's about knowledge sharing in organizations and across disciplines. And it's focused mostly on how to capture and share tacit knowledge, not explicit knowledge, but the things not just how we how we do things, but what we do, but how we get things done. Um, you know, the career shift was basically I was coming to the end of my career with the state. I had been doing instructional design and, and that kind of performance consulting my whole career. And um, I, I didn't really want to do it anymore. To be honest, sometimes I see a new tool and I'm like, God, thank you. I don't have to learn that one. Too. <laughs> you know? um, so I sort of, I had done a lot of speaking at the conferences. I have done writing for almost all of the training organizations you've heard of. 
And I let it be known that I was retiring and the guild called and said, well, Patty is, Patty is going to do other things and the director of research job is going to be open. I thought when they called, they were going to ask me to take the magazine. Uh, there's a fellow that's been doing it for years named Bill Brandon, and he's getting on up there in years, but apparently it was not yet his time. And, and I was not going to take a job if it was going to be the magazine. They said, we need you to, to work part time from your house, do a, a research report every month. And I'm like, sold, sold. So, I, you know, I wasn't really interested in a whole career change so much. I have a pension. You know, this is gravy. This is something that, you know, ad adds to my lifestyle and I don't have to touch my 401k yet. So, uh, so it was, but it was a really good move and it was a nice change and it gave me a chance to use all that doctoral research work, right? That I didn't really have much call for in my job with the state. So uh, I will say one thing, if you, if you work for, you can find an organization that provides academic assistance, take it, do that. That's free money. Take a glass, you know, do, do what you can do. Many, many times, like the state never had money for raises. Those are managed by the legislature. But we had money for academic assistance. We had plenty of it. The people didn't claim it. Every year we had some left over. So if you've got an opportunity for that, take it anytime you can. Agreed. I'm hearing that a lot here at IU. If you work for IU, you can get one or two classes a semester free. That's and great. so many of my students get an MBA on the side, you know, right. or whatever. So, yeah. This is a really good point. So the name I was trying to think of, so North Carolina State had the training and development. They were more adult ed than the University of North Carolina was. That's His name was something like Mecklenburger or something like that. Was there a professor? Oh, my God. Brad Me Mellenbacher. I knew yeah. Brad Mellenbacher. <laughs> UNC, you know what? UNC, I did my undergraduate work at Chapel Hill at UNC. They were not willing to put stuff online back then. It was all very much you have to quit your job and come sit at the feet of the master. Right. You right, want to go right, to UNC, right. and they're 10 feet apart. I mean, UNC is 15, 15 minutes from state. So I yeah. would say, Brad Mellenbacher, I think he's still there. He was a friend of mine's chair, and I am walking dogs with her on Thursday. I'll find out what he's doing. Yeah, send me an email if you find out. You know, I, I talked to him early on because he was an IU person. I'm pretty sure he's an IU grad or alum. I don't remember and, that, and, but probably. Yeah, yeah there's a, another guy. He has a surprisingly deep voice. He has a very deep voice. <laughs> One of my students from Spanish and Portuguese study, he, he minored in IST. His name is uh, Scott Despain. He's mm -hmm. there also at North Carolina. You probably don't know him, but he's very, very savvy with the technology stuff. Then there's a, a private school in North, near there, um, right near the campuses. What's the name of that private? It might be a woman's school. We have Duke. We have St. Mary's. We have um, St. Mary's is the girls' school near there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's where I spoke at St. Mary's, of, you know, about a decade ago. Yeah. Well, it's funny, it's just I have so... a, a cousin's daughter just graduated from St. Mary's and she did their like business with a concentration HR and she did a class on training and development. She had to write a lesson plan. It wasn't bad. Mm. Yeah. So I yeah. want to thank you for, sure. for sharing all this rich, rich, very important history with us. Sure. There's much more. I mean, what, you know, what you were talking about is going to lead us into next week. We or we got spring break next week, but the week after in knowledge management. And we're going to talk to my first doctoral student at IU who went to work for Accenture in Chicago for about 20 years and now is in the Silicon Valley as a, as a consultant. Um, and so we'll hear what he's been up to because I have not seen him since he graduated. It was 1995. Oh, when he wow. Graduated. Oh, wow. That so, was funny. Yeah, it'll be great to have him come in here. And I'm trying to think of who some of the other people, but I have four weeks in a row with talking to people who are more dealing in the corporate space. So this is a good lead into that to those the, the series of people I have coming in. Oh, Saul Carliner. I don't know if you oh, know yeah. him. Yeah, so Saul is coming in in a couple of weeks, too. And he's a hoot. He's just a, he yeah, he's, a hoot. So, he's so knowledgeable. And he's running the eLearn conference where I was the chair of the committee, kind of the executive director. He took over for me a few years back, and he's, you know, the eLearn, the conference called eLearn, um, part of AACE has kind of changed or evolved, just like Ed Media has. Um, it is, AAC has a number of conferences I've been helping with over the past couple of decades, and so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's so, a good guy. Yeah. Um, so, I, I see him. I'm occasionally in Montreal. You know, I speak at things there, and um, I usually try to hook up with him for dinner or something. So, yeah, so yeah. you know who else I have coming in? Huh. Tiagi. Oh, no. Well, you know, Tiagi was on Patty Shank's dissertation committee. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, so Tiagi's 180 fun. years yeah. old. Uh, he lives about three miles from my house. He was a faculty at IU a, a while ago, but he's a he's a very interesting guy. Yes. For those so, of you who have never heard him speak, he has a very thick Indian accent. And when, when he mentions it, he says, that's because I'm from the South. And he waits for a beat and he says, from Southern Indiana. So, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a fun guy. Yeah. That's yeah, creativity trainer and much, much more. So yeah, we have we have some excellent people coming in the next three weeks. You guys are gonna have a lot of fun here. Yeah. Them. yeah. But speaking <clears throat> of speaking, those of you who are interested in asynchronous interactions, he did a lot of work early on with how to do games and stuff via chat, mm -hmm. via texting, via email. He was yeah. kind of the leader in that. So you might ask him to dig back in his brain for some ideas around that. It won't be too far back in his brain. He develops a game a day. And, you know, he is part of that NASAGA, that National Association for Gaming and Simulations. And, and he brought that to Bloomington once. I spoke at it with him. I've, I've presented with him at ISPI in the past and other conferences. He's just, he's, he's a really great guy, actually. So with you, with Saul, with Tiagi, with my former student coming in. And then we have a student in this class who's in the military in Turkey kind of a high level guy who's going to speak near the end, uh, I think week 14. And we have someone coming from the Defense Language, no, not Defense Language Institute, Defense Acquisition University in DC, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. the DA, yeah, DAU. So yeah, we've got a great set of weeks coming up here. Again, I want to give a round of applause to Jane. Everyone give a Thanks round of applause. You're very smart. Thank you for having me and being so, so attentive. I appreciate it. And someday I'm I'll gonna, find something I like to do and want to talk about. I don't know when that will happen, but I'm going to stop this to the just the recording okay. for now.